Hello, huddlers. Welcome to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Recruit, Retain, Reactivate, Harvest Huddle Hour, R3H3. In this episode, we're going to discuss questions and comments for some of our past presenters. This episode is a recording of a live event we held with previous experts and the public. We fielded questions that the public had based on R3H3s listed in our video library. These R3H3 recordings are a resource designed by CDFW and the R3 team to bring more Californians to hunting, fishing, foraging, shooting sports, and just getting outdoors. They're meant for a beginner audience or those looking to gain knowledge around a new skill. If at any time you have questions, comments, concerns, or even an idea for an upcoming huddle, just reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Our email address is r3statewideprogram at wildlife.ca.gov. And now for our presentation on questions and answers with past presenters. So now for introducing our panelists, we'll start with Taylor Williams. She is the Recruit, Retain, Reactivate Manager for CDFW. She started with the department in December of 2021, right Taylor? Okay, and she's hit the ground running, let me tell you, leading the department in its work to recruit, retain, and reactivate more hunters, anglers, foragers, and shooting sport participants throughout the state. Taylor, thank you for being here. This is her first public appearance. Um, it is public. Yeah, so we're excited to have her out in the world now. Also joining us is John Ugritz. John is the department's pelagic fisheries and ecosystems program manager with a primary oversight for open ocean species and the offshore ecosystem. His camera won't be on today, but he will be here to answer all of your questions. He um, also leads the marine region outreach activities. He's worked on marine resource management and policy in California for more than 30 years, and we're so happy he could join us today and for all that him and his team do. Thank you, uh, John, for being here. Also from CDFW is Don Paganelli, or as many people call him, the Don Father. Don wears a lot of hats. He has worn a lot of hats over the years, too. Um, he is CDFW's Fish and Wildlife Technician for Interpretive Services through the Fishing in the City program. He's been doing that for 15 years. He's also been working with CDFW Conserved Lands program for two years. And outside of work, he has been a bass fishing guide and instructor for 20 years. Don, thank you for everything you do and for being here as well. I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of questions for you. So I'm excited that you could join us today. From outside of CDFW, our panelists include Captain Pat Patterson, who has been fishing for Kokanee in the Tahoe Truckee area for the last 15 years. He says he loves the challenge of outsmarting the sometimes finicky fish. He's an expert ice angler and a great resource for CDFW and for all of us to have here today. Thank you, Pat, for being here. J.R. No Young. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. J.R. Young is a lifelong hunter, recovering accountant, and Western States draw geek. He loves everything about the process of hunting, from learning about draw opportunities, researching new lands to explore the hunts, the people, the places, and hopefully, or sometimes, the harvest. <laughs> he believes that every stage of hunting brings something new to discover, learn, and grow from, and enjoys helping beginners navigate their journey. Thank you so much, J.R., for being with us. And last but not least, we have Tasha Bird. Tasha started learning to hunt later in life when she turned 40. Having no family to teach her to hunt, she sought out mentors in her community. Turkey hunting is her absolute favorite, but she also loves hunting deer, wild pigs, ducks, squirrels, rabbits, you name it. Whenever there's been a mentor available, she's tried to make the most of it by learning as much as she could in hopes of sharing that knowledge with us and all of you. So we're so happy to have her here as well. Tasha, thank you for being here. And now that everyone is here, we can just go ahead and start in on the questions. Okay, so we have a question for JR. JR, <laughs> now that yes. we know where we landed or didn't land in the 2022 draw, did anything new stand out to you about this draw over others? Um, it's hard to say, we don't really know yet. Um, just from a statistics standpoint, we don't get those until later. Um, the draw statistics for this year don't get published until next year. So, um, but we do have some anecdotal evidence of 
you know, just some of my time on Facebook of various groups, it does, you know, certain draws as expected require a little bit, a few, seems like they're requiring a few more points um, this year. I wouldn't say a few more points. Typically when I talk, we talk about point creep, it's usually about a half point to maybe a point per year. Um, but at this point it's all anecdotal. Um, so we won't know unless um, the department would love to give me those statistics early. Um, dropping a hint there but no um it'll be it'll, it'll be know. interesting to see um because I, and i've talked about this in our seminars before uh it's been a couple of wild years with covid the fires the drought the closures all that stuff i just it's gonna take some time to roll out to really spot to to try and determine spot some trends see how that all works itself out so um if but like for me, it's fun because it's loads of data and like, how do you interpret this? How do you make sense? Try and try and make sense of it, I guess. Um, and that's that's a fun part of what I do and why I like to do this. Okay, so what you're saying is um, you don't know yet. Ask you ask you next year. <laughs> yes, like I said, unless you got unless uh, uh, unless you, the, can get you know cash. license and revenue branch wants to give me the statistics early, then I okay. can start to make try and make sense of them. All right. We might, we should, that seems like we should, uh, <laughs> I guess for analytical purposes, but yeah. All right. Okay. So we don't know yet. Um, okay. For Pat, Pat Patterson, in relation to ice step, um, do you have any good resources that list current ice steps on bodies of water or what months generally are good for ice fishing? As far as resources for depths, there's not really any good. Uh, it's not like back east where they have published uh, okay. ice thicknesses because people drive out on the ice back east. So they, all the fishing reports, you can get the current ice fishing depth. Here in California, our uh, ice is just not really reported on that well. Uh, the lakes that range, the ones that I fish typically from uh, south to north, actually, the higher elevations are in the south, like Capels Lake, Silver Lake. Those tend to freeze earlier just because they're at higher elevation. So the further north you go, the lakes that I fish are, you know, in the Truckee area, Prosser, Donner. Donner rarely freezes over safe enough to fish, but uh, uh, Boca is the most easily accessed and the easiest indicator to pull in there take your ice auger to the edge, drill a hole, check the depth, measure it, actually measure it with a dipper or a tape measure. That lake is usually the easiest for people to access. And so if you look on social media, people occasionally will report on what the depth is. And of course, you're always free to give me a holler and I'll tell you what, what the latest. Soda Springs up on top also, Serene Lakes, it is one that freezes really early and again, has pretty easy access. So honestly, in California measuring- know, know the lake that you are thinking about first and then like kind of researching it that way? Honestly, the best, the best way is to call somebody that has okay. checked it. It typically starts mid-December to early January. Weather dependent is when the ice fish, okay. fishing season starts. The ice typically gets safe in that, you know, certainly by, the second week of January, there is a lake someplace that the ice is thick enough. And then it's completely seasonal here. Uh, how long it lasts, how fast the ice builds depend upon how many cool, clear nights we get versus if we get a little bit of snow. So the conditions are so variable. The best advice I can give is drill a hole and check or call somebody that you know has been fishing or watch the uh use the social media there's there's various groups um and you can always feel free to call me because you can guarantee i'm going to be out drilling to find out as soon as we can safely get out there um thanks pat okay looks like we have one for don don how much time can bass be out of the water without impacting their health if you're just practicing catch and release the quicker you get them back in the water the better uh, you know, there's no uh, set time that we put on it. It's just that, you know, you get the fish. If you have a live well in your boat, you can put them in a live well and then take them out, take a picture and then release them. 
Uh, if you don't have a live well, but you want to get a picture, try to use a net, keep them in the water as long as you can, get them out, take your picture, and release the fish. Uh, that's my, my input for that. I mean, obviously, we want to protect as much as we can. So it goes, with, it goes with any species, whether you're trout fishing or bass fishing, anything you want to release, you want to do it as soon as possible. All right. Thanks, Don. Tish, it looks like we have some questions for Tasha in the chat. She became very oh, popular nice. very fast. <laughs> um, the first question, Tasha, is as someone who started hunting later in life, where did you go for mentorship when you started? And can you share any resources that you may have? Um, and then Molly asked if you could talk about some of the cool pieces that you've made with animals you've harvested and how you got started turkey hunting. I was really fortunate to have a friend who used to be a guide and, um, but I, I would also, when I could afford it, I would also hire guides whenever possible and just, you know, bug them with as many questions as I could think of to get the most from my money, you know, so that I could learn as much as I could to start exploring public lands on my own. And then just thinking of it as a numbers game with how many hours I spent in the field and, you know, trying to spend as much time outside as possible, which it's kind of an ordeal if you don't live near those places. So I had to learn to really plan and I studied CDFW a lot. And I just asked as many questions of people as I could. Um, as far as uh, some of the, how I got started turkey hunting. Well, I was, I didn't, I never hunted until I was 40. Um, I didn't know anything about hunting. And so I started out thinking I wanted to pig hunt because they were invasive species and I was very idealistic, you know, <laughs> but um, it was a whole lot of nothing. And then one really exciting moment and then a lot of work where turkey hunting, even if it wasn't, if it didn't happen, it was a whole lot of interaction. I loved, love, love talking to the birds. So that's my very favorite hunt and, uh, I'm, you know, planning for next year already, thinking about fall, even though that's a whole different game. But um, yeah, turkey hunting is my favorite. Uh, some of the things that I've made from wild animals, I brought a few for show and tell. Let's see them. Um, <laughs> this is a uh, vest from my first deer, my first California blacktail. Had to go with real tree on the inside. So I, I, I'm an artist and I've been an artist all my life. I've done a lot of things from large scale, you know, fire metal work to small detailed jewelry and things. So I'm never one to waste uh, good materials. Uh, so this is from a pig that I shot. I do pyrography. So it's like wood burning, except for I do it on bone, which requires a really high heat tool so I don't know if you can see but this is a wild pig I shot and I I've learned to clean the bones but I kind of like to just send them out to somebody else and uh, this is a, another pyrography piece can you see it's getting a little whited out but it's, I love the red tail hawk and stuff and then the ones that I've got in the queue right now I've got way too many turkey feet in my freezer. But when nothing else will get the birds to gobble, I don't know if they just gobble to shut me up because I think it sounds so terrible. I'm not going to do it for you right now. But I make wing bone turkey calls. And uh, I think that they're just like a poetic connection to our ancestry as hunters because I was looking it up last night again to make sure I have my numbers right, but there there's a 6,500 a 6, BC wing bone call in the Smithsonian Native American Museum. That's a long time ago. So anyway, those are a few of the things that I make. Those are absolutely beautiful. Um, how did you, did you teach yourself more, one more. how to do that? My hat, my turkey hat. I make a lot of things out of turkey feathers, so, but that's it. I love it all. 
Um, and Molly commented on your pieces. She said that she loves the pieces Tasha makes with the animals she harvests. Excuse me. She's so talented and very creative. Everything is beautiful. Oh, okay. So thank you for sharing that stuff with us. That's yeah, awesome. I'm glad I didn't even remind you to have any props and you did. That was awesome. <laughs> some people might not have you know, watch that huddle yet. And you, you just explained kind of some things that you do with your harvest. I love it. Um, thank you. Uh, John, we got in a question from you or for you, not from you, <laughs> for you also. Uh, does the zoomable map of California public fishing piers, jetties, and breakwaters list every available place to fish from a pier, jetty, or breakwater? Or is the list still adding places? And if it's still being added to how often is it updated? Yeah, thanks, Dish. Um, so the the map includes all piers, jetties, and breakwaters that are designated as free, where you don't need a fishing license to fish. Um, there are lots of other places along the coast where you can fish, including some other piers and jetties that aren't technically free. So it's really good to check that first if you plan to fish without a fishing license. And then the other thing to remember is that even though you don't need a license on those piers and jetties and breakwaters that we list, you do still have to follow all of the other rules and there's some report cards and things that you might have to have for certain species. So definitely good to know the rules, but if you have a pier or jetty that you think should be on there, you can definitely reach out to us and we can either add it if it's one we missed or let you know why it doesn't count because there are some very specific rules as to what makes it a free fishing pier, jetty, or breakwater. Um, oh wait, thanks, John. Uh, JR, we got another one in for you. I got an A zone tag. It says I need to have it countersigned by a peace officer, judge, firefighter, ranger, et cetera. Do I do this right after I shoot a buck or can I wait a few days? Where do you prefer to sign your tags or who do you prefer to sign your tags? Um, all, all tags, regardless of zones need to be signed off, um, have the same sign off requirement, um, with the exception of bear tags have to be signed off from CDFW specifically, you actually have to go to one of the offices and, but the deer tags, there's lots of options, firefighters, peace officers. Sometimes I I'll say that in, you know, I've, I've heard this many times, like a lot of people, there are certain types of authorities that have no idea that they're authorized to sign. So um, I do recommend that you not necessarily line something up ahead of time, but just try and think think a little bit about of where you're gonna go. But um, it does need to be signed off immediately or directly on the way to the place of processing, which processors, meat lockers, et cetera, can sign off on it. So if you're gonna bring it to a meat locker, you can go there. That's typically your best bet. They can countersign it for you. Um, if you're gonna process on your own at home, um, think maybe your local fire station, stop in now between now and when the season starts. Um, is a good opportunity, maybe your local post office. Some people that live in the more rural communities, this is normal. Um, where I live in the Bay Area, you know, I might get a little bit of a strange look because, you know, just certain workers, maybe they're new to the area or whatever, they're just unfamiliar with it. So just do a little bit of research on that. Um, I'm lucky enough, I have my, one of my good friends is, uh, is employed with the um, San Jose Police Department, so he can always sign off on my tag. So, um, but a little bit of work ahead of time will save you a lot of headache. Good tip. Thank you so much. Taylor, did you have one? Yeah, we have another one in the comments from or in the chat from Molly. Um, and this is probably for John, Don, or Pat, whoever wants to answer it. Um, are there any resources for people that are new to fishing and want to know where to find some good spots that are local? I can comment on that. Uh, in the Sacramento area, or we have our fishing in a city program where we stock a lot of the ponds right here in the city of Sacramento. Uh, right now we're doing our catfish stocking. That'll go on till September. All the ponds are stocked uh, twice a month. So those are open to the public to fish at any point in time. Plus we have clinics that we put on if you're new to fishing, uh, where we actually instruct you and teach you how to fish, uh, the classes are actually set up for five to 15 year olds, but we don't turn anybody away. Uh, that you can get all that information on the Fish and Wildlife website. If you click on Fishing in the City Sacramento, it'll bring up 
all of our events. We also do virtual seminars. And in those sem virtual seminars, you can ask us all kinds of questions when it comes to fishing. Uh, another good resource is your local tackle shop. Uh, they will definitely have all the information on anything local to the area you're trying to fish. They're there to sell you whatever it takes to catch those fish. So if you're fishing for a specific species, uh, tell them that and ask them what you need and how you go about it. And most of them are very good at uh, instructing you on how to use it, where to use it, uh, and all that. So uh, for anybody just traveling, I think the best local resource is your local tackle shop. Uh, you can also check social media uh, for that, but sometimes people like to brag a lot on social media, so you, you never know how much of that is uh, is real or not. But uh, uh, but the local tackle shops are also good places to check. And I'll jump in, Tish, for ocean fishing. If you're looking to fish off the beach or a pier or or somewhere from the shore. I probably would recommend, a, like uh, was just mentioned, the, the local knowledge, the local tackle stores will, will be able to help you out. There's also uh, chat groups and, and social media groups that help with that. If you're trying to fish on the ocean from a boat and you've never been before, I really recommend starting with a commercial passenger fishing vessel or party boat out of one of the major harbors. You can take a half day trip or a whole day trip on a party boat. They will teach you all about the right gear to use. Uh, you can rent gear if you don't have your own. And they provide a lot of information and advice and they give you the right baits and really help teach you how to do it. It's a great way to start if you've never done it before. Thank you, John. Pat, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I definitely want a second. A couple of the points that were made. The local tackle shops can't emphasize that enough. Uh, the guys that work in there, the guys and gals in there, as Don said, they're trying to sell you what is going to work. And quite often they have a list of local guides that can take you out, whether it be fly fishing in a little in a, in a little Truckee River or the main Truckee or whatever part of the state you're in. They have folks that uh, would get you out on the water if it's boat fishing, whether it be inland or marine. Going with a guide, picking the right guide is important. When you call to reserve a spot with a guide, you want to talk to them about their services and what they offer. Some guides, their goal is to get you your fish, and that's the main goal of the day. But if you talk to your guide, I, I grew up with my dad taking us to new areas that we never fished before, even though we're lifelong fishermen, we don't know what's going on in that area. And you go with a guide with the expressed intent that you want to learn the local water. You want to learn the techniques, the tackle, what kind of gear you need. And if you speak with a guide and, and relay those desires ahead of time and make sure that that's something that the guide is uh, willing, a service that they're willing to do. Most good guides will spend that time to educate so that the focus for that day's trip might not really be, oh, we have to catch a limit at all costs. The focus is more, hey, I wanna learn how to run the gear. Can you explain to me why we're choosing this spot? What time of day, all that goes into catching fish and that resource is money well spent because I can tell you, I wish I'd have taken a kokanee guide like 18 years ago when I started kokanee fishing because it would have put me a lot uh, further along a lot faster. But at the time, I just learned on my own. So I uh, didn't take my own advice back then. JR, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, I just say a comment. Um, so my son's currently going to uh, a camp down in Seaside on the coast, and this is a ways away from my home. But I literally just followed this pattern yesterday because I'm like, well, when we get out of school, we go fishing in the surf. So the first thing I did was I looked up the local shop. I went in yesterday. I said, hey, you know, I'm down here for the next couple of weeks because we're going to camp. And they gave me some ideas on where to go, what to use. 
Um, like any good business owner, sold me a couple, sold me a couple of lures that I could use. My rod and reel that I had was perfect, but I, I got enough information to get started. And then um, since he gets out early on Fridays, tomorrow after school, we're going to go out and we're going to go hit the surf. So it's, it, it works. The local shops are typically great, um, a great resource uh, for anybody to try to get started, especially if it's a new area. Um, and I don't, I don't surf the fish, I don't fish the surf a lot, um, but I think I got enough information to get started. And if nothing else, we'll go out and have a good time tomorrow. So that, that, that plan works. At least you're outside enjoying the beach with your son. <laughs> Um, Don, it looks like we have another question in the chat for you. Um, someone said for bass fishing, should I be fishing in clean or cloudy water? And what is the optimal water depth? Well, uh, for this time of year, uh, the bass have done spawning. And usually when they spawn, they go into a little bit of a funk for a couple of weeks. And then they bite comes back on again because they get hungry and they start foraging all the way into fall. Uh, so early morning, uh, top water bite, throwing top water lures early in the morning is usually a good bet or late in the evening. Uh, they use bass are predators. Got to think of them as a predator. So they're using low light conditions as a source of cover to be able to ambush prey. Sometimes cloudy water can be good, especially water where you're in a lake and you get a lot of boat traffic. And after a day of boat traffic, it creates this mud line that comes off the bank. And that mud line is actually cover for those bass. They'll go up underneath that. And that, that mud line only goes down about two or three feet at the most. Uh, it's not muddy water all the way down. Uh, and that acts as a cover blanket also. Uh, throwing plastic worms and stuff like that through those uh, conditions can usually work pretty good. Uh, so it's not really clean or dirty water. It's just the conditions you're in, where you're at. Uh, if there's a lot of weeds, you know, throw something that's weedless that you can work through the weeds because those bass will be in there. Sometimes it takes a little bit more time to get them out. Uh, also that water temperature rising like it is uh, there's less oxygen in hot water. So the hotter the water is, the less the oxygen content. So if you're fishing really shallow water on extremely hot weeks, chances are the bass are going to vacate those areas. And they're going to go to areas that might be a little deeper where they've got a little bit more oxygen. Uh, like Clear Lake, California, where we had a massive die-off because we had a week of extreme hot weather. Uh, the lake was very shallow and it sucked all the oxygen right out of the water. Um, so obviously you gotta look for those conditions. So if you are fishing from the bank and the water's kind of shallow, look for areas where the water drops off, gets a little deeper and fish those edges. Very good info. Thank you, Don. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, and Tish, if you don't mind, I actually have a question for JR, um, unless you had something else. No. Okay. Um, JR, in the big game, breaking down the big game draw, R3H3 we did um, in May, we didn't have time to talk about the different ways that you can hunt big game in California with archery, muzzleloader, rifle. Um, can you talk about your favorite ways to hunt big game? Um, my, my personal favorite is with a, a modern rifle. Um, it's the way I grew up hunting. Uh, I have muzzle loaders um, and I've done muzzle loader seasons, not in California, but elsewhere. Uh, I do do a little bit of archery, um, especially during the, the A zone season, because um, there's nothing like walking around with a bow and 100 degree temperatures. But um, rifle is my favorite. And part of that's just my setup, it's my time commitments. Um, it gives me personally the greatest opportunity for success. Um, but I think with, with anybody, I mean, archery can be the easiest to practice because you can do it in your yard. Um, so people can get very, very proficient, um, at the skill set of, of shooting, of utilizing archery. Um, but the skill set of the hunt is something that can take a much longer to develop just because of the, this, um, the, the need to get closer to the animals and that can, you know, learning the wind and, um, depending upon where your conditions are, if it's loud and noisy, you know, dry, crunchy oak leaves, et cetera, 
uh, all those create individual challenges um, with with the hunt. So hopefully that answers it. Yeah, I just I wanted our viewers to kind of know all of their options, um, but I was really curious about your preference too. <laughs> I was. Go I have a question for Pat also. So how do you determine your fishing spot on the lake? It doesn't seem very easy to move spots once you've set up. So how do you ensure that your initial choice is the best? Actually, it's really easy to, when you're first getting on the ice, it's pretty easy to switch spots. You just have to drill extra holes, uh, especially early season when you're first getting out there to see where the fish are. The ice thickness is generally less than a foot. So even with a hand drill, which you can start out with, it, it doesn't take that long to drill a hole. But the, in all honesty, it's using a, a bathymetric chart for the lake is a good place to start. So you pick your spot, oh, I want to fish off this point or this deep hole, depending upon what species you're targeting. And then you put your electronics in there. Uh, there are a ton of electronic options, but it's really important for ice fishing, and I think it really adds to the enjoyment. You're not just drilling a hole and putting some bait down there. You can catch fish doing that, especially in some of our better lakes, but it is infinitely more enjoyable if you have electronics. They, they have even uh, little fish finders that you can they float, you put them in the hole and you can look at them on your phone. That's one of the cheapest options. But then electronics run the gamut up to and including the Garmin latest version of LiveScope, which is absolutely amazing. You can see your lures, you can see if there are fish and you can scout about 150 feet in any direction. You can spin the transducer and literally find a school of fish oh they're 70 feet away that way and you just pace off 70 feet drill a hole and you're right on top of the school of fish or you can use it to keep an eye on a shoreline you've drilled a hole out away from shore and you're looking at the shoreline i i got some really nice trout on davis lake that way this year when i just was finding nothing out in the lake and I went out to one of the small islands set up about 50 feet away and just sat there with the electronics looking vertically, taking a slice vertically towards the island. And I would see fish swim by and they were swimming by in three feet of water right up against the shore. So electronics is the answer. Um, and, you know, I started with relatively inexpensive electronics and because I'm a guide, I went to top of the line electronics because it, it really adds a lot of uh, scouting capability, much more so than than just drilling a hole and sticking some bait down there. Good tip. Thank you. Uh, Taylor, looks like we had some more from the chat. Yes, we do. Um, Vic asked, is there any way for a newbie to get informal mentor access? Just getting a firsthand idea of a hunt or scouting, maybe by accompanying an experienced hunter and observing. Um, Tasha, do you want to talk a little bit about this since you recent, well, not recently, but you've gotten into hunting as an adult? Yeah, I would say go to your, a good place that I met people was at the archery range or at the shooting range, you know, um, you can... If you see someone wearing camo, you can ask them if they hunt, you know, and, uh, or ask, start asking around your friends, because if, if they don't hunt, they probably know someone who does. And if you're, I mean, that's as informal as it gets, or otherwise I would say when, when, and if you're able to hire a guide and just be ready to maybe do more learning than hunting, even though, you know, you can kind of do both. And Vic, we also have some resources on our R3 webpage. Um, if you want to check that out and reach out to us at any time, we would be more than happy to help get you in connection with people um, that may be able to help you. And we have another question. It says, for people that are used to hunting small game and birds, what big game animal do you think would be easiest to get into hunting or learning how to hunt? Um, I, JR or Tasha, whichever one, whichever of you two wants to take over this one. I'll go for a second. Um, I mean, I recently got, last season, I got two bucks and I was able to handle them 
by myself. So, you know, I'm not as big and strong as some people. So I think that if you're going to try to do some big game by yourself, that says something as to, you know, that you'd be able to. Yeah, I, I'd say, I mean, with, with, in terms of opportunities, uh, deer, uh, deer and pigs, both pigs are, can be challenging on public land, number one, but, um, but the, uh, the opportunity is wide open given the, the full year season length. And you can utilize that deer hunt or you can utilize that pig hunting time um, for potentially scouting for deer or scouting for bear. I mean, that's the, the great thing about hunting and being in outdoors. Your, your clock should always be on, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, like you should always be thinking about, you know, potentially that next hunting season, that next location, that whatever. So even if you're out for pigs and you don't see anything, be looking for other sign and finding those opportunities. But switching from small game and upland game to big game, um, definitely size. So pigs and deer are, are one. Bear, again, has a tremendously long season for us. Um, but even all of our across our, especially I, between deer, pig, and bear, all three of those seasons, are incredibly long, provide long opportunities, um, and you can try and utilize your, your learning curve year round, um, whatever, whenever you're out to, to try and, and you know, gain knowledge on those specific species, but definitely deer and, and pigs would be my, my first choice. Awesome, well, thank you guys. Um, I have a question for John. Um, John, when discussing marine protected areas, I know that I can pull them up on my phone or my device wherever I am. Um, but if my phone's not getting service, are the MPAs marked somehow where I would know that I'm entering one? Yeah, thanks. It's a good question and a tough one um, because most MPAs aren't marked on the water. Uh, so you really do need to know where those boundaries are. For all of them, we have great online resources that you can look at in advance and, for example, find the <clears throat> latitude or longitude coordinates and then use your GPS in the field to know if you are north or south of a certain line. Um, they're pretty pretty easy to navigate that way, either from the beach or, or from a boat. Um, we're working right now on a truly mobile app for the department that will include the marine protected areas and actually give you a warning when you're entering one that probably won't be done for another year. Um, so in the meantime, I recommend using the resources we've got online, looking at them in advance and just knowing uh, where you are once you're out there. Awesome. Um, thank you. And then going back to the app, um, I know you guys have the marine species portal. How often do you add species to that? Um, and if we had a question about something that's on there, who would we contact? So we add species as we can. We've actually got a list of about 55 more species that we're, we're actively working to add to that. There's more than 100 on there now. I think it's about 120 or 125. Um, it's really good information. One of the key things that uh, keeps us from adding new species is the really cool uh, hand painted images of all the species that are up there. We actually have an artist on staff who's doing all of those um, herself and it just takes her a while to do the paintings to get them right. They're, they're actually accurate to, to a live animal. Um, so that's what takes a little while to add new ones. Um, if there's any questions for anything really marine related, we're pointing everybody to our Ask Marine email address, and it's just askmarine at wildlife.ca.gov. Um, that way we can direct your question to the right subject matter expert, and they'll get right back to you. Um, thank you, John, for all of that. That's very, very helpful. Yeah, we got some in for Don as well. Don, uh, I'm interested in purchasing a certified scale to weigh bass on dry land. Any suggestions on where to find a good one? I've seen some online. Uh, you just have to kind of and search and and make sure they're certified. They're certified scales. Uh, so I'm not sure if you have to search certified scale. Yeah, a certified scale for California. If you're in California, uh, because in order to certify a weight, it has to be on dry land. You can't weigh it on your boat or a dock. 
uh, and there's a lot of other things to uh, if you're trying to find out if your fish is uh, a record of any kind. And I'm assuming that's why you're looking for a certified scale. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into that. And I'm sure there's a lot of information on a website, on our website for that. When it comes to fish and wildlife, I know that we send somebody out to certify the fish, verify that it is that species that you're trying to certify. Um, but yeah, just make sure that the scale is exact, you know, is a certified scale and whatever it has to go through to be a certified scale. Okay. And then they added on, uh, you spoke a bit about water temperature in relation to spawning. Aside from spawning though, what would be the optimal water temperature for bass fishing and what time of year would we typically see that water temperature? Well, typically their spawning season runs from February through May or June, depending on where you're at. Uh, some areas start sooner than others, depending on the temperature. Uh, generally, when the water temperature reaches uh, the mid to low 60s, they're in the mood to spawn. Uh, prior to that, as the water temperatures start to rise, like in February, uh, we get into a pre-spawn mode where the fish are coming out of their winter mode and they're feeding really heavy, trying to get bulked up for the spawning season. Uh, and then as the temperatures rise, uh, bass will be very active in water up to 80 degrees. Uh, but again, if you start to get in water temperatures where you're 85, 90 degrees, that's when you start worrying about oxygen content. Uh, so, you know, we get into the fall bite and fall fishing can be fantastic because they know winter's coming and the temperatures start to drop a little bit and the fish go on a crazy feed bite before they are bulking up for winter time. Uh, so those are also great times to fish. So pre-spawn and fall fishing uh, can be some of the best fishing, bass fishing you've ever had. So uh, when you're looking at that plus weather conditions, you know, lately we've had some crazy weather, especially when it comes to these small fronts that keep moving in and out. Uh, bass uh, are affected by barometric pressure changes. Well, a lot of fish are because they use their swim bladder as a way to rise and fall on the water column and barometric pressures affect that swim bladder. So if you see a front coming in, watch that barometric pressure. When it starts to drop, usually the bite shuts off. And as soon as things stabilize, the bite comes back on again. Uh, so those are other things to look at. Obviously there's a lot of little variables. If you're not catching any fish, sometimes it's one or two of those little things that'll do it. Thank you. Um, Tish, it looks like we are getting close to the end of our timing, but we have one more question in the chat. Um, and this one would be for Pat. Um, Pat, for ice fishing, how would someone know the depth of the ice from the bank to where they're setting up to fish? I'd imagine they're worried a little bit about walking across um, the ice and getting to where they want to fish safely. Can you talk a little bit about how you measure depth a lot of ice along your path? Yeah, for sure. You just have to drill holes, uh, especially the first time out on the lake for the year. Once you've drilled a hole right close to the shore uh, where the water depth is so shallow that if you did step through, you'd have a wet foot, but you wouldn't go in over your head. You measure the depth right there. If you determine that it's thick enough, you start walking, you know, 5, 10, 15 feet out, depending upon how fast the, the bottom drops away, and you drill another hole and you measure it. And that first time out on a lake for the season is the most critical because uh, often ice will form in the coves first close to shore before the whole lake freezes over. So it's really important to watch for any changes in the appearance of the ice, which can be difficult once it gets a little bit of snow on top of the ice. But regardless, the most important thing is drill a lot of holes on your way to where you want to fish so that you can detect changes in the ice thickness as you're walking out so that you're sure that you're still on safe ice. You don't want to get out on the thin ice. Typically, 
if there isn't a blanket of snow on the ice, you can see changes in the ice. If you see a difference in color or a place where a pressure ridge maybe pushed up the edge of the ice as it was freezing and it gets kind of clumpy, you want to check both sides of that before you go walking out onto new ice. That's, that's really the best way is just drill a lot of holes, which if you're in good shape and you have an ice auger that's super sharp, it's pretty easy to drill a hole, especially they have different size ice augers. Depending upon what species you're targeting, you may need a larger diameter hole to bring the fish up. In California, most of our fish can come in through a six inch hole, which is super easy. It's, it's, it's much easier to drill those smaller diameter holes with a manual auger than the eight or the 10 inch holes. But once you get either a gas or now the new electric ice augers, uh, it really, I think, increases ice fishing safety having an electric auger because the new ones, you can drill 2,000 inches of ice on a charge. So you're not hesitant because you're getting tired to drill those safety ice depth check holes. So I, I recommend starting with a six inch auger if you're doing a manual one, making sure you never nick the blades on the bottom or on debris in the ice. A lot of times people will throw rocks at the edge of the ice to see if they can break it and then they get frozen into the ice. So you don't wanna hit any of those. But if you keep those blades sharp, have a replacement set of blades on hand that you can swap out if your blades start getting dull. They're almost impossible to resharpen. So drill a lot of holes and measure the depth. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. That seemed um, very, very informative. I, it makes sense, but it's not something that I would have thought of initially um, about like the coves and stuff freezing first. So thank you for that. Before we wrap up, Tasha, we got, it was more of a comment and I just wanted to, to tell you it. Um, it said, as an adult onset hunter like yourself, I found your segment on turkey hunting so inspiring. What you said about being okay not to take a shot to find peace in knowing you harvested humanely rather than force. I appreciate you saying those words out loud. I don't take lots of shots and sometimes I'm frustrated with myself later. You made me feel better about where I am in my journey. Thank you. So um, thank you for, for all of your participation. Thank you, Tasha, for inspiring that person to keep on going with their journey and for everyone being here today. Um, a huge thank you to all of our panelists and of course you our huddlers for taking the steps to educate yourselves on becoming the best hunters, anglers, foragers you can be. All right, that does it for this Recruit, Retain, Reactivate Harvest Huddle Hour. If you have questions for any of our presenters, for the R3 team, or for me, feel free to email us. Again, our email address is r3statewideprogram at wildlife.ca.gov. Feel free to also use that email if you have an idea for an upcoming huddle or if you want to share with us your favorite outdoor photos for our three photo of the month. Speaking of, this month we actually have two photos of the month. Thanks to the Yang family for their submission of multiple generations of family fishing in Marin County. And also a big thanks to Fred for their photo out hunting with their grandkids. Thank you both for sharing your photos and for sharing the joy of hunting and fishing with the next generation. Until our next huddle, tight lines and straight shooting, thanks for being here.